Hello dear e-lovers, I just recorded three hours of a news podcast for the German uh, edition of this with uh, more people than here, here I'm usually alone, um, but I'm already, already tired and I felt like I should just go to the gym, do my exercise and go to bed as soon as possible, but um, some people on Twitter talked about uh, Shadow of Fire and I promised I would finally talk about it i've been talking about this for a long long time so uh yeah hokage by in my opinion um the greatest uh director ever probably i mean the like maybe three people we have Shinja Tsukamoto we have Nobuhiko Obayashi and these two have some things in common that we will talk about in a minute and uh, earlier this year um, uh, Shinji Somai entered the scene the discussion uh, he claims this title and um, yeah but I, I think Shinja Tsukamoto will always have a very special place in my heart because he's pretty much responsible for my current film taste and uh, yeah I remember I watched long 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 time ago I watched uh, Tetsuo at that time I just bought Japanese movies on DVD that I could find and there was this double pack of uh, Tetsuo and Electric Dragon whatever vault uh, an absolutely fantastic movie that i didn't watch at that time i still haven't watched that dvd i just watched it when the blue wave from third window films came out and at that time i just watched tetsu for some reason i decided i will watch this and uh, i i've always after i always remembered it's a good movie uh, i always wanted to watch more by this director but I didn't really, I, I wasn't able to really appreciate it the way I do now. Now I watched it about, I, I don't know, really many times, 50, 60 times, I have no idea. And um, after that, a few years later, I watched Vital without knowing that it's the same director. One of my friends just had a DVD and he was like, oh, this is this is Japanese horror movie and... We watched it and we realized, oh, it's not a horror movie. It's basically a drama. So we, we liked it, but it wasn't what we wanted to watch that day. So it didn't really have any impact as well. And a few years later, I watched um, this one. Uh, Nobi, Fires on the Plane. I have uh, three of these. Um... <laughs> Don't ask why. Uh, I, I watched uh, Fires on the Plane now probably eight times, just in the cinema, not the Blu-ray. So, um, so I buy these. Um, yeah. Anyway, so I watched um, Fires on the Plane at the Nippon Connection. It must have been 2015. And I, I remember I, I had the choice between this and Over Your Dead Body by Takashi Miike. And at, at that time I felt, ah, oh, Takashi Miike will be released anyway, this I'm not sure. So I better watch this. I don't, I, I think Over Your Dead Body got released in the West someday, much, much later on DVD, where this was already out on Blu-ray by Third Window Films. I thank you very much. It's an amazing disc and everyone should buy these. Anyway, like all, all the Tsukamoto movies, almost all are out on Blu-ray by Third Window Films and um, they're all very good discs and I can only recommend them. There are now, I think, three Tsukamoto movies that you can't really get from them. That's Nightmare Detective, Nightmare Detective 2, and Tetsu the Bullet Man. And these are all like the less popular Tsukamoto movies, and there are some right issues. I've got them all on Blu-ray from Germany. And uh, yeah, so it's not impossible to get them, but I think there are no really like English subtitled versions of those. I mean, I mean, Tetsu the Bullet Man is like 19... 
five percent English, but uh, yeah, it's it's not a popular movie. I love it, but uh, I know why people don't love it. Anyway, so uh, I watched that and I was horrified for about five to ten minutes by the look of that movie because I came from Tetsu. I, I remember Tetsu. I didn't really remember Vital and this like gritty 16 millimeter black and white bombast bombast optic uh, really spectacular and then you get to this low budget clean digital tv look and i was terrified i was like holy cow what did i choose here i took one of my friends with me and uh, what what did i do to him at the end i loved the movie and it was a uh, uh, wonderful. So this made me buy the Blu-ray of Kotoko, and I think I got the Blu-ray set of uh, Tetsu 1 and 2 as well. And I watched Kotoko, and Kotoko blew my mind and completely changed my view on movies in general. And um, since then, I'm the biggest uh, Tsukamoto fanboy I know. So uh, if you care about my opinion on him, you came to the right place if you want uh, something maybe more critical. But I, I think I'm totally fair if I'm with, with my... Uh, I, I just love the stuff that's not so popular more, but I know why people don't love it. So uh, anyway, um, so since then, Tsukamoto has a big, big uh, part in my heart and... A place in my heart and uh, when I moved to Japan in late 2018, December 2018, the first movie I watched in the cinema was uh, Killing. Yeah, his next movie that came out after um, Fires on the Plane. So that's another very special event for me. I think that cinema doesn't even exist anymore. It was a pretty old, relatively big, but pretty old cinema in uh, Fuse in Osaka. I forgot the name, but I think it's it closed pretty soon after that. And w when I went there, there were almost no people. It looked really interesting because it's so old, a little not so clean. And um, there are maybe two or three other people who watched the movie. I could be wrong, but not very popular, not very busy. And it was the first time for me to watch a Japanese movie without any subtitles in the cinema. Um, uh, yeah, so I was terrified that I might not understand anything. Turned out to be okay, totally fine. I, I didn't get some details, but uh, mm -hmm. I watched it again. So now I watched it uh, killing quite some time. Killing took some time for me to really appreciate it, but that's a different story. It's not what we're going to talk about. Um, today we're going to talk about Shadow of Fire, but these three movies um, that basically cemented my, uh, well, they're like cornerstones of my history with Tsukamoto are basically one trilogy and he might add one more to this so it might become a quadrilogy or something like that um well, now it's a trilogy i'm doing almost the same uh thing here that thomas does on the uh, wonderful uh audio commentary on this um i'm gonna say two more interviews or something there's a talk event that i haven't oh yeah a talk event and um stage greeting and the videos. I haven't watched those yet. I'm sure it's all good, um, but I haven't watched them yet. It's not important. It's important, but not important now because we want to talk about the movie. And anyway, so it's a trilogy of anti-war movies that you can easily connect to his previous movies. Um, for example, Shadow of Fire is a post-war movie. And you could say the same about his earlier movie, uh, Gemini, which is another post-war story that has a contrast between the uh, classes, yeah, 
and um, has quite some similarities with this one. And I, I just watched it by accident um, this year in January, I think, or last year in December. So pretty shortly after um, Shadow of Fire came out, I, I made the plan to rewatch this whole filmography. I'm still not done because I have these projects and I stop and I do something different and... Uh, Anyway, so I watched it and I thought, oh, it makes so much sense to put these two movies together. And the same, I think he puts them together himself. Um, Bullet Bully and uh, Fires on the Plane, where he said in Bullet Bully it's about uh, young people who don't know about violence and war and these things. And therefore, in their free time, they're bored and they go out into the city to seek the violence and um, without even knowing what may come. And uh, Fires on the Plane is basically the continuation of that theme where people are in the war and they're in a situation that they can't handle at all. And... Um, yeah, they somehow have to deal with this extreme violence that's going on here. And I, I think that's one thing. Uh, Obayashi had the same feeling, like, sh relatively short time before he passed away. He started to make anti-war movies because he felt like young people don't really know about war. They don't have any sense for war. And therefore, they need to be educated about this topic. And I think they both did it brilliantly. Uh, Obayashi as well did a trilogy and one more. So Tsukamoto might do the same. Um, and uh, they both did it absolutely brilliantly, but in very, very different manners. Especially like in the first two of Tsukamoto's trilogy fires on the plane and killing these movies are excessively violent gruesome brutal and uh yeah it's supposed to make you feel mm -hmm. the violence and it works very well and this is an aspect that we don't have so much in uh, shadows of fire which is more of a drama so um, it might not be what many people want from a Tsukamoto movie, but maybe for some others it's a, a good entrance into his cinematic world, because if you watch all his movies, they're all somehow connected. Uh, he's uh, like one of the most independent film directors in Japan. That, uh, he has been producing his movies for a long, long time, mostly by himself. I, I read a story. I remember he, he talked about... Um, there's a motorbike outside, so crazy uh, bikers at night always going here. Whoa. Anyway, uh, he, um, he... I think he talked about how he finances his movies, maybe in the context of the Bullet Man. Anyway, he said he, he filmed as much as he could and when he then needed money, he took his material to the production companies that were willing to talk to him and said, here, this is what I'm doing. I need some more money. But because he already started, they can't really interfere with, with his plans and just have to go with it. And I think that's a really, really fun idea. I, I completely forgot where I uh, got this from. But uh, yeah, it's... Uh, he he kept his um, freedom so far very well. He just did two studio pictures. That was uh, the aforementioned Gemini and um, uh, Hiduko the Goblin, which is a very, very fun horror adventure comedy movie, which is... Uh, Gemini is, is uh, wonderful as well, more of a, like post-war drama, uh, Gemini is a literature adaptation from an Edogawa Rampo novel, and Hiroko the Goblin is a manga adaptation. I forgot who wrote the manga, but um, both are very fun and very interesting. And um, yeah, anyway, uh, let's get back to this 
trilogy. Like I said, everything is connected here. You can see connections between all his movies. For me, it was especially this one and um, Gemini that made a lot of sense. And yeah, so this trilogy, just to mention that we have one movie in 2014, 18 and 23, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, 14, 18, 23, and um, maybe one more coming. And here, this one is a little bit special in its uh, structure and how it is... Uh, like the whole concept is very interesting. It was released last year, 2023, which was for me a phenomenal year when it comes to Japanese cinema. Like there were so many fantastic movies. We had Shin Kamen Rider. We had uh, the first Slam Dunk. Well, that might have been 2022, and I just watched it 23. I forgot. Uh, we had the absolutely amazing retake which almost nobody has seen we had uh, the boy and the heron here's a miyazaki movie we had the absolutely fantastic wonderful self-revolutionary cinematic struggle by gaku ryuishi which too has no nobody has seen this movie uh, most people seemingly don't like it or at least the three movie in japan as uh, the three people in japan who have watched it didn't really like it. I love it. It's a fantastic film. Everybody should watch it. Um, there was Kubi. We had a uh, Bad City. We had Ichiko Badlands. So many uh, new religion. Uh, Techno Brothers. Egoist uh, Monster. Especially like all the big established directors throw their movies out, which is why I felt like um, 2024 might be a little bit less great, but. Uh, last few months, the last few months are so many young directors have put out so many wonderful good movies. I will talk about more of them in the next few videos. I haven't recorded them all, but uh, one of them was, for example, My Sunshine. Um, wonderful stuff, so that's uh, very exciting this year, but last year was like all the established people put out big movies and it was super exciting another movie that got me very excited and in the end this uh, disappointed me very very much was godzilla minus ron if you have actually watched my videos here like one of the first one i i talked about my issues with godzilla minus ron i think it's a very conservative nationalist movie and many many people praised it for being this uh, fantastic uh, humanist post-war drama. And Shadow of Fire is actually what people see in that. And it's interesting to see that a movie produced by a company that's called Kaiju Theater, uh, that doesn't have any kaiju, is the better kaiju movie <laughs> than Godzilla Minus One. Um, no, I really don't like Godzilla Minus One. I think it has some fun scenes, but everything in between is just terrible and uh yeah some scenes are maybe mediocre but uh yeah mo mostly bad and the whole political stance is just disgusting so this one is what people want to see in godzilla minus one we have a post-war setting even though it's never clearly stated when and where it's set it's clearly in Tokyo after the Second World War, and um, we have a small story about some people who get together, and even this combination of people is very similar to Godzilla Minus One. We have a woman who uh, here in this case lives alone, we have a little boy who comes to her house, and in the end more or less stays there at least for a while and we have a soldier who ends up there as well and they form some kind of um, family even though no one of them is related they don't have any like love like romantic um, involvement it's just people coming together and um, feeling a little bit safe and good in these bad 
times and here the times are really really bad and really hard um everybody suffers a lot they have barely uh, they, they have barely any food um the woman is a prostitute um the man actually suffered from trauma not just like in godzilla he wakes up oh i'm scared no he, here it's really really hard and um completely makes him go crazy and uh, makes him uh, stops him from functioning as a normal human being and completely takes over his uh, mind um and this boy is in the center of everything and what kind of damage this might do to a boy um we will find out more or less um let's get to the cast a tiny bit like i said there are basically three people there's some people around them but uh there's no maybe we have to mention four maybe uh, anyway this uh lady at the beginning is a uh, shooty uh, who is an actress who i've seen in some movies she was for example in uh, tremble all you want uh, in wandering or in the holic movie which i didn't like at all and in the very very good intolerance and around the time when this movie came out she was in a tv series that's called boogie yogi that's i think set around the same time so she was used there in a maybe slightly similar setting at least and she's the daughter of yutaka mizutani a relatively famous actor who was for example in the man who stole the sun and the youth killer and uh, her mother is uh, ran ito uh, another actress and a uh, singer i don't know anything she did but uh, yeah so an artist's family family's a uh, child and then this soldier is played by uh, hiroki kono who i have seen in special actors and then we have uh two more we have the little boy of course his first role here it's uh, oga tsukao and uh, another role that i haven't mentioned yet that's more important later in this movie is uh, mirai moriyama who i have seen for the first time in fish story which which was my first third window movies dvd at that time and which i still consider one of my favorite feel good movies ever probably it's absolutely fantastic i will eventually talk about it here but watch fish story do yourself a favor if you want to feel good a little bit after maybe watching shadow of fire watch fish, fish story it's a, a wonder wonderful movie and um he is usually more dancer and this physicality and how he uses his body is really amazing here but we will get to his part in the story and the spoiler part um let's talk a little bit more about maybe this is the first bit and what's going on there why this movie is so interesting like i said we have this setting of a completely bombed tokyo it's kind of a mystery how this um, how this building uh, stayed more or less intact but it's completely like uh, burn marks everywhere it's dirty it's not very nice and um there's this woman in there and one of the first things we see is that an older man comes and has sex with her and uh, she obviously doesn't enjoy it but she doesn't really stop him and then we find out it's kind of a pimp or something like that and um yeah it's there's this fantastic scene like after this more or less um uh, unwanted intercourse uh, she breaks down behind the counter there's like a bar counter and just her arm comes up and the title goes around her hand and it's just a crazy uh, image and um what's 
pretty clear very early is that on the one hand we have this very clean digital look which is maybe not the most cinematic thing in the world it looks sometimes a little bit cheap even though i think this is probably among the like very digital tsukamoto movies the most beautiful maybe because especially in the first part we are always in this house we never leave the house it's a small contained set and he uses it very wisely very effectively um especially if we have a physical scene like that it's very much probably through this uh, digital look very intense very direct very disgusting there's nothing uh, nice or erotic about the sex scene and it's a really really horrible and then we see a man storming her house and being angry looking for something and we found out the boy who stole some food because that's the only way he knows how to get food and after a while she tries to um to help him to stop him from becoming a criminal so her goal is basically to make sure that this boy becomes a good human and um yeah that's how they get closer a family like bonding and uh, it's very beautiful to see this relationship flourish like i said this soldier shows up at some point and uh, first he was told that there's a place where he can find some uh, peace and happiness and uh, he didn't re really realize that he's going to a prostitute and um but basically he gets some alcohol and he goes to bed and he's just sleeps and he's like oh it's the first time in ages that i could actually sleep so he wants to come back so these two characters just come back to her house and first they annoy her but because yeah she f pities them in a way and uh, she wants to help them yeah they're basically more or less allowed to stay there and um we have this blossoming family like relationship and that's what i think is very different from godzilla minus one of course things here are getting better too at least for a while same in godzilla but in godzilla you have this more or less destroyed tokyo and some people who are maybe a little bit dirty but it doesn't really look that uh, horrible and threatening it's a bad situation but you're not like really terrified by what you see unlike this first uh, interaction here in this house where violence is obviously something that daily uh, that happens on a daily basis and there yeah just people are running away from some others are hiding and suddenly they are basically a happy family together and uh, we have a beautiful montage how tokyo becomes a great city they suddenly have a house a guy has a motorbike uh, he has a job that's dangerous but he's a professional soldier so he can do it easily and uh, they don't really struggle it's just oh we are here suddenly in a nicely rebuilt japan and it just happens like nothing because the people of japan are so great and that's not really what i would guess is a realistic depiction of a post-war country i mean yeah there is a hint that the guy might have a little trauma that stops him from sleeping poor baby but it doesn't really do much else and the other characters don't have anything like so just basically living normal lives and it's ugh. and here like i said we have a woman who needs to sell her body to make a living we have a boy who needs to steal to not die we have a man who's so traumatized that he can't even move and he's just a crying thing and uh, 
it's just so much more impactful, so much more impressive, depressing. It just... Ugh. No, and even though it gets better, it gets better in tiny steps, like the soldier teaches the boy some math, so he gets tiny bit of education, or maybe she makes him some clothes or something, yeah? or she repairs his clothes or washes them. So very, very small things that suggest an improvement. And that much spoiler ahead um it all gets very much worse uh, after a while but we will talk about that in a second and um yeah it's just uh, so much it feels so much more real even though he might have taken one or two liberties um but it just feels more like you would imagine a post war world and seemingly he chose to not mention the place or the time because he wants you to feel more like to give it a more universal feeling that could be in your country after the next war that might happen could happen at any time any place it's not just here as uh, the poor people in japan are victims it's uh more universal feeling people suffer after war you could put this movie in any country any time any place it's all all the same it's not so specifically japan even though he based it on his childhood experience like i think he said in uino when he grew up there was still some black market left and this black market setting is what gave him the inspiration for this movie um, so people try by all means to survive and it's very clear and very um, easy to understand that here is no not, nothing that that's just like quickly solves all problems like in Godzilla where yeah, yeah we just have a montage and then the world is nice and beautiful until the lizard shows up and it's a different thing here is nothing that tells you how great japan is and how wonderful they rebuilt the city or stuff like that it's just just uh bad and there's one amazing special effects scene <laughs> there are very few special effects here but there's one great scene where basically the burnt tatami floor turns into a model of the bombed city and it's really depressing and scary we still have some music from chu ishikawa who sadly passed away quite some time ago it was before i came to japan so tsukamoto used his music or whatever was left over of uh, his music already for killing I think in Killing he recycled some older soundtracks as well. And for this one he f got some hard disc from Ishikawa's wife, I think. And um, found in a folder, in a folder, in a folder somewhere on this hard drive some more music that he could use for this one. So I guess the next movie will be the one where he actually needs some different um, composer. I think so far only uh, Hiduko the Goblin and Kotoko didn't have a Chu Ishikawa soundtrack um, for, for, for uh, Hiduko was some other composer and for uh, Kotoko there's I think only the music by Koko so the uh, main actress that uh, she composed or sings in the movie I think there's no other movie uh, no other music uh, anyway, so here's like the last leftovers um, of Tushikawa's music, which is always super intense, very, very great, but uh, yeah, really, really intense and uh, quite scary uh, sometimes. And it still fits perfectly. Um, yeah, so we have a very impactful movie. We have a lot of close-ups a lot of things here just happen with looks with 
facial expressions. Um, so it's maybe a little bit more subtle than some other Tsukamoto movies um, where just change happens by mutating or something. Um, that's not happening here. Uh, here we have like subtle looks between characters, a little dialogue, and not even names are really important here. I, I don't know if the, the main characters, except for um, Moriyama's character, they don't even have names, I think. I'm not sure if they're ever mentioned. So that's another thing. It's He tries to make it as universal as possible. These people could be everyone. And um, yeah, I highly recommend watching this movie. It was my favorite movie of 2023, which was an absolutely fantastic year. Uh, Godzilla Minus One was one of the worst movies I have watched that year. Uh, just to make sure the, the Super Mario Brothers movie was worse. Yeah, that was probably the, the worst I've seen last year. But um, Godzilla Minus One is down there. This is the upper end. And. Uh, yeah, I don't need to mention in my rating system between 1, which is very bad, and 5, is, which is very good. This obviously gets a 5. It's a fantastic film. But let's talk a little bit more about the spoiler part, uh, because it's much more interesting to talk about this movie when we can actually talk about the interesting structure and what happens later and how this all develops and how this comments on this post-war society. So one thing is our soldier who is so traumatized. Um, of course, it's a post-war world. People still have guns and stuff. So one night um, he hears some gunshots from outside and he freaks completely out, turns violent, wants to rape the woman. And uh, throw the window as uh, the boy throw a window, and it's uh, probably the, well, yeah, one of two really excessively scary, violent uh, scenes that are very much old school Tsukamoto with a lot of shaky cam. Which I think he is one of the few people he, he does it really, really excessively, and sometimes I wish it was a little bit less. But I think he usually does it very well because he's shaking like crazy and um, it's hard to see what's happening, but he's not cutting so much. So it's still possible to follow. Like even my, maybe the worst movie in that regard he made is uh, Tetsuo the Bullet Man. Um, it's shaking like crazy. I know people who hate the movie just because of the camera. But I feel like I can see always what's happening i know always what's going on i know where the characters are even though it's shaky like crazy i know what's happening i know the like geography of the scene i know where the characters are. i know what they're doing and that's the same here it's a short scene so he freaks out he throws a boy out of the window he wants to rape the woman and suddenly has a gun pointed at his head uh, it turns out that the boy, he has a bag that he takes care of very, very intensely. Nobody can touch his bag because there's a gun inside and he feels like a gun is the only or the most important thing you can have in this um, post-war world. And that's another connection between his movies going back to Tetsu, where basically human and weapon are one yeah so the most obvious it's in tetsu 2 where the characters just grow guns from their arms and their chest and stuff and shoot things and um here of course it's a normal gun that a human holds in his hand but uh it's clearly like an extension of the body. The same goes for fires on the plane, where they have their rifles and uh, killing with the sword. And uh, in killing, it's very interesting because our main protagonist is a good sword fighter, but can't really kill and needs to 
basically learn to kill and or escape from learning to kill. That's the thing uh, we might figure out when we talk about killing. And we, I just say it now. We will eventually talk about all Supermoto movies here. Eventually, someday, I will. I will do them all on the German podcast. I have done almost all. I think. So if you speak German, just go there and listen to the episodes. It's been a while, uh, but I think it's uh, still. I, I sometimes listen to myself, and I still enjoy it. Um, some interesting guests there as well. Anyway, so uh, shadow fire. So we have this complete escalation, and suddenly the movie takes a big turn because now we have a pair that works perfectly fine. But she decides the boy needs to get some money or some food or something. He needs to work. Sends him out to work, and someday he comes back and is like, oh. I've got a job offer. I've got to take this gun and join this guy for a couple of days to go somewhere. And she freaks out and says, you can't do that. But she realizes she's sick. And uh, therefore she pretends that she hates him, kicks him out. And uh, yeah, he goes on this trip. And many people say rightfully that the first part is more like a small, intimate, uh, what is it called, a Kammerspiel, yeah, I, I I can't come up with the English word, probably a, I don't know, Kammerspiel, subtitle, and um, then it changes into a road movie, but I don't think, I mean, in, in a way, it's correct, in another way, if you look at in another way, it has been a road movie all the time. We just switch the person we follow. Like, first we stay with this woman in her house, and the boy comes and goes and um, has some more or less exciting adventures, finding a job, getting beaten up and stuff. And if we would just stay with the boy all the time, we would already have a road movie from the start. Um, because he just tries to find a place he belongs to or he can stay at and um, ends up there for a short time, but he still needs to get out and in the end she kicks him out. So, yeah, I, I think from his perspective it has been a road movie all the time, um, but we just join him after like half the movie is over and we leave this house and suddenly the world opens up and suddenly the movie gets fun for a while, it gets colorful for a while because suddenly we have nature and it's green and that's another thing that has been in this, tri uh, in this trilogy where um, society is basically still bad. Like in his movies... Like the city, the urban lifestyle has always been bad and uh, people returning to nature was a good thing and connecting with nature has always been a good thing. If we look at Vital or Kotoko, it has been a thing for quite a while or in the Tetsu movies, like the modern society needs to be destroyed in uh, Tokyo Fist. They need to overcome the sterile modern lifestyle that's so far detached from being human yeah so um here it's, it's similar like in the city the life is terrible it's horrible and once we get out suddenly it's at least a little bit fun it's a little bit nice you can f catch a fish in the river and um just when he and his new partner, Mirai Moriyama, Moriyama, go on the strip. The first thing we see is them peeing uh, at a wall. And uh, Moriyama already finished and is waiting for him. And they have a dialogue while the boy just keeps peeing. It's so grotesquely fun how long this boy pees. Um, it's, I mean, Tsukamoto's movies are always a little bit funny. No matter how dark and depressing they are, there's always a little, 
bit of fun and it's the same here and this fun suddenly comes when we leave the city we go into the nature and um yeah, in, in this uh, countryside setting, there are still bad things like children are being sold and uh, traumatized people live in, in what is it called, uh, in a shed or something. Is it a shed? I don't know. Probably a shed. Um, like, we see the effects of the war, but around it, it's still nicer. It's uh, friendlier, less depressing, less destroyed, I think that's the important thing we're more on the countryside and um yeah in the end we figure out that we are on a revenge miss mission and um we figure out that revenge unlike godzilla minus one doesn't really fix anything just makes you go straight into darkness and um uh, uh, we figure out that um, there's a big gap between the hurt and harmed from the war and the people who gave the orders to harm people who uh, maybe a little bit higher class who have a nice life and um, yeah, just keep on living. I mean, it's a thing you have to keep on living after this, but uh, it's pretty hard to see this difference like you have this of I, I don't know what what kind of rank he had like this this higher rank military guy living in his big beautiful house with his nice wife having a nice food while people in the city just have to live in these horrible conditions and uh, are not sure if they survive another day and um that's very impressive and that's an, like connection to a Gemini where we have the same, we have the higher upper class people, doctors, family and so on and we have the people from the ghetto and um, yeah, the same here, very similar uh, situation here, just not as prominent in the story but uh, yeah, it's still quite impressive and yeah in the end the, the boy just uh, gets back home and tries to figure out a way to live in this horrible world while staying an honest decent person like she told him to be and um, we don't know what really happens with him in the end we have another scene with the um, soldier from the beginning we have some other stuff but it's all very um depressing the same he eventually gets a little job he gets some money and finds out he can't really buy anything from this money he tries to help her but he's like <laughs> goes to a shop i can I buy medicine well, no that's not enough and um that's another question will it be enough to work or will he eventually end up in a situation where his little money that he makes is not enough. Like here, will he be able to live a decent life? Uh, we have no idea. It's all open and it's not very um, positive. I mean, it's not all just negativity, but uh, yeah, it's a pretty horrible, horrible situation that we get presented here, unlike... Uh, Godzilla minus one where you just uh, bomb away the lizard and suddenly your trauma is uh, healed yeah I know there's some ooh there's something bad uh, still lurking um, but overall uh, Godzilla minus one is way too easy on these themes it doesn't really take anything seriously um, just suggest that going to war isn't so bad. Let's remilitarize re uh, Japan. Of course, Japan has uh, self-defense forces that are officially not a military, but uh, yeah, I know, I know. Um, anyway, so I think as a post-war movie that actually wants you to feel the effects the after effects of a war and how 
much people suffer and how their traumas will not be cured by anything, whatever you do. You're just doomed if you go to war and you survive. Your life is still over. There's nothing you can do to just recover and uh, be happy again. Um, so in that regard, this movie is so much better. So if you want to watch any thing about post-war Japan, watch this one. Don't watch the lizard. If you want to see a lizard destroying stuff, watch the lizard. He has no lizard, but uh, if you if you want an actual humanist anti-war movie, watch Shadow of Fire. Yeah, it's like so much better in every regard. You know, like even the female characters are allowed to be like real characters that have important stuff to do and uh, have some deaths not just taking care of kids even though she's taking care of a child um now it's it's just just in every regard just not maybe the cgi uh, this movie is so much better like i said it's probably my favorite movie of 2023 i remember i went to the cinema in kobe uh, Mr. Tsukamoto came there for a talk event and I went there to get here my little uh, signature and I thanked him for always making wonderful movies and he like bowed down like he's about to go through his little table and I was so moved finally uh, meeting him. It was so wonderful and um yeah, like I said, I'm the biggest Tsukamoto fanboy I know. But uh, that's legitimately my favorite movie of last year. The next one would be Shin Kamen Rider, which uh, has Shinya Tsukamoto in it, who's uh, surprised and uh, not me. Anyway, um, yeah, it's just an amazing movie that probably could be talked about much, much more, but I guess that's enough for... Today it's a uh, very interesting, very deep, very like you can probably watch, uh, write some uh, papers about it. I, I wrote some papers about the Tetsus, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, it's just, just fantastic. I, I love Tsukamoto, all his movies, and uh, I would say this is one of the better ones, even though they're all pretty amazing. But yeah, I would say maybe maybe top top third yeah maybe not top one but uh among these better ones in his filmography and very very worth watching yeah we get here the uh blu-ray by third window films um i'm not the biggest fan of this cover i mean it's still fine but yeah this uh, is the original which i actually prefer but uh that's why we have two. It's all good. And um, yeah, go get it. It's really, really amazing. It's great. I should watch the other special features as well. But uh, yeah, we will eventually talk about more Tsukamoto and then I will probably come up with some more connections to this movie because I remember something I saw in the other movie. Oh, uh, have a nice day. Watch Tsukamoto. Watch more Japanese movies in general. Watch maybe some Koji Wakamatsu. Uh, do whatever makes you happy. If watching Godzilla Minus One makes you happy, please watch Godzilla Minus One. Uh, do it. Enjoy. Enjoy life. Uh, don't start a war. And uh, see you soon. Bye. Hello, will you?